Right, g'day folks. I'm really concerned about this audience. It's extremely unbalanced. <laughs> this side here is so blooming heavy. <laughs> yeah. So um, hopefully uh, we won't tip over. So, um, yeah, Mark Harris from Gallagher. I look after marketing um, for our animal management business. And there's a couple of my colleagues in the room. So um, when it comes to question time, if we get the FI don't run too long so that we still have some questions. They are not allowed to ask any questions at all. Um, yeah, so that would be dangerous. So I'm going to give a little bit of um, a view of um, Agritech, where it is now, and where, where it might go, and um, with a little bit of a case study about us. And, and so that, because of course we've been a New Zealand Agritech company for 78 years, which is quite a long time. So I was a bit offended yesterday when, um, when some of our um, speakers started talking about Agritech as if it was something new, because we've been doing it for a bit. Um, so the Gallagher story in a nutshell, uh, I think probably most people here know it. Um, uh, Bill Gallagher Senior was a farmer and um, threw a horse that he tried to um, uh, stop licking on a car. He basically invented the use of electricity to, to stop uh, animals or, or to control animals. Uh, and um, he, he did a little experiment and, um, with, with his horse, worked out that it would work and then de developed an electric fence unit that could control or put a pulse into a wire. And that pulse and that wire would control stock and it meant that the, he could get much better uh, control of his grazing of his animals. So that was where electric fencing was born in New Zealand and it was quite revolutionary really because in the past you'd have had to have built a barbed wire fence um, and uh, had at least three, three wires, probably four, and now all of a sudden you could use one wire, hardly any infrastructure, and you could you can control animals and, and get much better grazing. So it was a revolutionary breakthrough, and the cost benefit to the farmer was massive. You know, like like um, we're not talking about buy something and, and get a get a fifty percent return. We're talking about sort of a ten times return or more on on the on that um, on that invention. So this was the um, type of things he was, he was building and obviously his neighbours heard about it and they wanted one and then they told two friends and then they told two friends and so on and eventually uh, a business was born and he stopped being a farmer and started being a, uh, an electric fence manufacturer and they set up a company but really the big change came, that was the first big change but there was a second big change and the second big change happened in the 60s and it came out of one of our CRIs this chap here, Doug Phillips, um, he invented the low impedance fence. So, and, and basically what that was, was instead of putting a, a certain amount of electricity onto the fence, you know, hundreds of volts, he worked out that if you put on a very, very short little impulse that was several thousand volts, but really, really short in time, that that pulse would travel down the fence far better than a, than a wide pulse. And it, it would also, if you had leakage in grass, um, the shock would be able to get past that. So it wouldn't all leak out at the first little sign of trouble, it would keep going past. And um, so that was the major breakthrough that happened in the 60s, and the Gallagher family cottoned onto it, as did a number of others um, in the Waikato and around New Zealand. I think um, Sir William tells us there was sort of 10 or 15 manufacturers at that time um, touting their, their products, because everyone tends to jump on the bandwagon. But there was a difference, there was a big difference with um, the Gallagher family, and that was uh, they were great engineers, they were entre very entrepreneurial, very good business people and they were driven and they were driven to also start the export. So through the um, 60s uh, the business grew, the, the brothers came back into the, into the business and they built a very successful little New Zealand business. And at that time they had about 10 or 15 staff and then they went offshore. So they had a successful New Zealand business, small number of staff, maybe they had 10 to 20 staff at that time, and then they started going offshore and it's taking this invention to the world. So at that time when they were offshore, they, their products were like a thousand times better than their competition. So it was, it was a big, factor, you know, big difference over, over what was happening overseas. And they teamed up with people offshore and they, and they um, started um, exporting these products. So that was kind of the story. So where we are today, um, fast forward, that's our uh, headquarters in Kansas City in, in the USA. The fellow that's responsible for running that sits sitting over here. 
Um, and, and we've got places like, we've got, we've got facilities like these, distribution centres like these, and, and all the major electric fencing markets. We've got people on the ground. Our stores, this is a store in the US, so we've, we've got a very consistent um, store presence globally. We've also um, got infield support, so we've taken the time in these markets to actually train farmers, exp explain, help farmers with adopting the technology and getting the value out of it. So over this, uh, the export journey has been over 40 years, and, and over those 40 years we've built up to having something like in the animal management business, we probably have 250 odd staff offshore, something like that, um, who whose responsibility is to manage our products into the reseller network and to assist our reseller network in creating demand for those products with the farmers that, that we um, are trying to help. So that's been a massive journey, and what's sitting there today is for New Zealand is quite spectacular and, and very successful. So, and, and this is, these are, these are our distribution centres around the world. So you can see that we're uh, pretty well represented. I estimate, uh, we've, we've, we reckon we're about 20% of the global market. So, um, and we're the number one um, electric fencing company in the world. So what are the ingredients to success? This is the sort of punchline, I suppose. That's why I didn't talk, tell you about Joe the horse very well. Um, but um, the punchline is that uh, the Gallagher story, when if, if I look at it, you know, as a relative newcomer into this business, 15 years, um, the, it was a local problem that was found. So there was a local problem. I want to graze my stock better, and it was a local problem that was solved, and the business got going and, and locally, invented the product, started selling to local customers, proved it. Okay. Um, the next step was to um, yeah, get that business sorted, so we manufacturing, logistics and so on, and then to take it offshore. And in taking it offshore and started selling, the company then learnt about the local problems that were offshore, because the offshore needs are different to the onshore needs. The basic principles are the same, but if you now look at our uh, business today, the customer we have in New Zealand and the customer we have in the US is completely different. New Zealand guy is, is farming as the business, they're running, you know, four or five hundred cattle at least, or, or dairy cows, um, and, and they're intensive, intensive use of this, of this product. Then you go up to, up to the US, there's 20 cattle on 200 acres, and the guy's got another job in town, and it's a hobby. The product, you know, the requirement for the product is com and the value proposition for it is, the value proposition position is actually similar, but the, the needs of the product are completely different. If we'd have gone to the state straight off, we probably would have failed because we never had the market knowledge. So by starting in New Zealand, then going off, it created quite a successful sort of recipe. And that's enabled us to, yeah, to really understand those offshore markets. Yeah, that was my sort of point. I've, I just put up a whole lot of brands, like other, other agri-tech companies. You can see this, these are only a few of them. There's a heck of a lot of um, agri-tech companies in New Zealand. But there's a real common theme, and that's that if you look at them, most of them are centred around grass production systems. So, you know, um, I, I, I'm probably a bit conservative, and I kind of feel that um, it's pretty difficult to meet a need that you don't really understand. You've really got to understand the, custom, the customer's need and satisfy that need well. So there's no, it's not um, an accident that these guys are all centred, mostly centred around um, pastoral farming and um, processing products off those um, pastoral farming systems. So what, what does the future hold? Um, my other life is a farmer and um, in New Zealand. So this is a New Zealand focused, um, my view on the New Zealand challenges that we're facing right now. But they are, they are international. Again, internationally they'll be different. So um, the first one is productivity increase while increasing, while managing our environmental footprint. There's huge pressure on agriculture at the moment around environment, <coughs> and that's, that's global. In the grazing systems that we have, we've got um, increasing pressure on our grazing systems now, and they, they are different to the uh, environmental challenges that are offshore. Uh, I think there's huge opportunity over the next few years to address these, this in New Zealand in, in a way that um, delivers results for the environment and enables us to maintain um, our productivity, or hopefully increase our productivity. And, um, and I think there's going to be a lot of opportunity for agri-tech startups in this space, 
who can who can come up with novel ideas to um, to creating some of the, solu the solutions to the right problems. So that's one area. The other area is animal welfare. I don't know about you guys, but I, I get tired of um, some of the stuff I see on telly. Uh, but it really is um, driving home to us how important our animal keeping processes are and, and the perception that others have of those animal keeping processes. And, you know, mostly New Zealand's, you know, the cow in the meadow with the little yellow daisies on the, on the ground and all that? That's the image that we want to portray, portray, isn't it? And that's what people like to think about when they think about pasture-fed animals versus an animal that's in a barn with sores on its legs and, um, you know, can hardly walk because it's been bred as a milk tanker and, you know. So, um, so we, we really need to um, make sure our image is more towards that cow in the meadow than the cow in the barn. Because the cow in the barn, in my view, is what everyone else does. And, and we do the cows on the pasture. So um, I, I think there's a lot of opportunity in the animal welfare space um, around making sure that our farmers know how to look after their animals or have, have new systems so that looking after animals is a lot easier. Um, so it's easier. At the moment, it's, it, farming's getting more complicated. We've got to this point where, um, and this is my next, my next area, but um, we've got to this point where the focus on the pasture and the animals is becoming kind of, that's the key thing the farmer needs to do. And yet at the moment we're focusing on farm environmental plans, um, compliance for Fonterra and the meat companies, and um, you know, there, there's so many things throwing at the farmer that it's diverting away from the core job that the farmer needs to do. So I think there's real opportunity in this animal welfare space for technology to help the farmer understand their, what's happening with their animals and to make good decisions around, um, around those. Simplifying agriculture, that's, I already sort of covered that. Um, it's just, it's too complicated. It's far, being a farmer, like um, I work in a, in a uh, you know, in a, in a sophisticated company in town. And, uh, you know, we have SAP systems running, we have, uh, the company is, the company's got enormous amounts of systems to deal with um, uh, uh, identifying a customer need, designing a product, manufacturing a product, getting the product to market. We've got an enormous complexity. Then I go home on the weekend and I muck around on my dairy farm and um, it's more complicated and there's only two people running it, you know, and, and we're expecting these people to be to do a good job. So you can see why the corporates, some of the corporates are starting to do quite well because they've got professional management sitting over the top of their farm. So they're able to, um, they're able to kind of deliver that you know, the, the, they are able to look out. They are able to look out and see what's happening and, and, and adopt new practices and whatnot. But for the average um, owner operator, which the bulk of our market still is, it's getting it's getting too complicated. So I think um, with technology, you know, where we are today, there's a real opportunity to um, to simplify the whole farming operation through through automation of information and automation of activity on farm. So there's going to be a heap of heap more. We've seen this over the years, haven't we? We've seen a heap of this stuff happening with um, labour-saving devices. You know, uh, rotary cow sheds was a good example. Um, yeah, there's, there's a plethora of examples of, of um, productivity improvement tools that simplify, and and we need to get that around our information and our compliance. It's just it's too much stuff. Um, and then th my final one is capturing more value. Um, there's been a real focus in the 2000s, in the you know 2000, of, of increasing a uh, big trend towards um, increasing dairy, you know, incre and it's all been about increasing production off the land, kilos per hectare, and um, and, and everyone harps on about increasing value. I'm going to harp on about it too, because my view is is that it's far better to sell a kilo for ten bucks than it is to sell it for five bucks, um, because the costs in producing it aren't that much different. You know, the cost in producing a, um, if you think about automobiles, you know, the cost in actually producing a great war ute versus the cost of producing a uh, Ford Ranger aren't that different. They've still got a similar amount of tin and uh, plastic and bits and pieces in them, but the Ranger sells for twice as much, so I know which one I'd rather be dealing with. Um, so, and it's delivering value to the customers actually, um, the customer believes they're getting better value. So. We need to find the value points you know, with our customers and, and deliver to those 
with our, our, our primary produce and get up that value chain faster than we are now and drive back down onto farm the, um, the requirements um, that, those, that those value points require. And, and my view, I think that that's not happening fast enough and good enough at the moment and there's a lot of opportunity there. Um, so that's, that, to be successful in agritech, I think the key things that are written up there. So you've really got to, at the front end, know, what, know where you want to be. You know, can you, can you visualise success? And that means that you have to have a, a really well-validated value proposition. What problem am I, am I solving? And what's the value to the, um, to the end customer? There's a few other things you need. You need the right people. You need money. Um, and you need to know where you've got gaps and, and partnerships. So that was the last thing I really wanted to talk about was um, partnerships and what partnerships can do for agri-tech startups. And I was just going to give you a couple of examples where a couple of startups are working with us to access um, some know-how that is making their lives a little bit easier. So the partnership opportunities. So um, IP, you can, you can access IP, uh, and that could be in both directions. Um, obviously money, R&D, like if, if you think about our company, we've got 100 people in R&D, or a bit more, and we've got very good understanding of how to go about developing a product and not causing the, um, the famous um, twice as long and two times the cost that we used to suffer in the old days. We kind of worked that, that problem out. Um, manufacturing, so it's setting up manufacturing is obviously pretty expensive, so why would you want to go and set up a manufacturing plant for your innovation if you're a startup, when you, most of them will access their manufacturing from someone else. Um, and obviously distribution and marketing. This is the, probably the biggest, in my mind, the biggest um, gap in, for startups is how they're actually going to sell the product once they've got it. it, it it's, it's so difficult and it's the underappreciated um, aspect of, uh, of being successful. You know, the entrepreneur thinks, oh, well, heck, this is a great idea and once I've, got, once I've built it, they'll come to me. But um, they don't. Uh, someone's got to got to do that work, and so looking for um, the appropriate supply chain to sell your product, and then accessing that through others, you have to give away a fair bit of money for that, but with damn good reason, and that's because it's expensive. Um, and then um, finally, brand. Uh, if if you're starting from zero, you you don't have a brand, you don't have any any value, whereas if if you work with another another party, you can sometimes it's very uh, you can get instant credibility. Um, but those brands with that credibility are going to look at the entrepreneur pretty hard. They're going to say and look at that product and make sure it's right that it's going to fit with them. Because if it doesn't fit with, <coughs> fit with them and they and they take it on under their brand, it can cause damage the other way. So there's a lot of opportunity in partnering. Um, and I've got a couple of examples here. So this one here is um, a, a company that Gallagher has invested in just recently called Addison's in Australia. It's a um, company that's attempting to bring a, um, a wireless fencing product to market. And they came to us mainly because of our expertise in animal control and the impact of stimulus on animals, um, plus a number of other reasons. But um, so this is a, a good example where um, these guys are sort of aligned with what we do, animal control, and we've got some technology that, and potentially a brand that could be extremely useful to, to these guys. Another couple of examples here. My Apri is a company that I think you, some of you guys will have heard from on Tuesday. Um, they're building um, a workflow management system for, for beekeeping so that beekeepers can manage their productivity better. Um, and uh, they've got some other aspirations as well, and um, we've, we can add some value to them as well. Um, the one on the bottom left, Flashmate, Gallagher Flashmate, this is a good example where um, these guys realised that taking the product to market was going to be very difficult for them, you know, in terms of um, uh, creating awareness in the market and also gaining credibility to that product. So we did a lot of work with them to understand their product early on and, uh, and help, ha are helping them go to market. Um, and finally, the one on the right, Dashboard, that's a joint venture. Uh, we've been making a lot of hardware products uh, that capture information, and we've been struggling with interfacing with third parties. So people want the farmers want to get their information into other systems 
so that people can add, you know, help them add value. And um, we have been struggling with getting enough companies fast enough to interface to our gear. And so we're doing two things. One, we're creating a, a, a we've created a online system that enables um, uh, farmers to directly uh, share their information and, 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 and analyse their, their information and try and make decisions. But we're also using it as a conduit to get to third parties as well. And that's a joint venture we've formed with Andrew Cook at Rosette um, to deliver this dashboard product to market. So Andrew's business had already had this block of software. We wanted to get into that market space and um, so we put his capability together with our channel and, um, and, and now we're trying to move our business forward um, through this means. So quite a good example. So that's pretty much it. So um, there's lots of other examples of partnering in Gallagher. It's been an absolute um, means by which we've, we've grown. Most of our new categories and, and so on have occurred through um, partnerships with other businesses. Yeah. So that's about it. Any questions? <clears throat> so, uh, so, in, so in our world, in the tech world, we think of, of investment opportunity and entrepreneurial opportunities in sort of three categories. You know, one is developing things that reduce cost. Yep. Um, developing things that increase productivity and increase revenues, and then developing things that change the game. Right. So the example of the latter is like the fresh cut lettuce example in you know in Monterey County, where instead of shipping heads of lettuce, you ship washed cut lettuce for consumers, changing the game, right. getting you know two times the dollar value per pound or whatever the whatever the metric is. What's going on here in terms of you know those categories in terms of the innovation? Do you see them evenly distributed across? That spectrum, or is there a in, in ag tech? In ag tech, you know, is it cost reduction? Is it productivity enhancement? Or is it, you know, from an investor's point of view, changing the game is kind of the most exciting opportunity. That's where you tend to get the biggest pop, right? Yeah. Well, it depends on the scale you're looking at, because you know, you can change the game in a little wee area. So, for example, that that little thing I showed you on the back of a cow, yeah, that's an absolute game changer. In its, in its little field, but it's only the market, you've got to look at the market size and how big it is. So, mm -hmm. so I think it's a mixture. This is the virtual fence? No, 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 no the little wee heat detection unit that was sitting on the back of the cow. Oh, the health, the wellness detection, or the health detection. Uh, health that thing tells you whether the cow's ready to mate. Okay. So, it, it, no one had, had really, you know, you guys in the US had a product called Heat Watch. Yeah. Do you know that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. 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 Well, this one, this one retails for 10 bucks and it's disposable. Whereas a heat watch was a was a thing that you had to glue on the it was very expensive blah blah blah, so this was this is the first um, disposable um, it, it's yeah and, and it's got a chip on board so it's so that that in my view is a is a um, is a game changer in that little sphere, but it's only a small niche yeah, and and what you find what I think is is that if you look at most of our ag tech companies most of them are working in real niches real small niches. You know, yeah, uh, yeah. they're not creating um, not not creating things that are that are uh, going to necessarily create hundreds of millions of dollar industries. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, maybe they maybe they will when they when they pivot and apply to other other problems if they develop core technology. Yeah, yeah. Okay. But I don't know. I don't have a view. Of, I don't know all the um, all the little ag tech startups that are around the place. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Sorry. Someone so else might have a view on that. I've got, a, uh, I've got a big picture question for you. Right. So in the United States, uh, grass-fed meat is growing 30% year over year. We produce 235 grass-fed cattle for 400 million people. Uh, How many? 235,000. What? 235,000. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, globally? If we look at the meat production, 70% is uh, confined animal feedlot. Yeah. How do we get back to 70% pasture-raised meat on a global basis? You've got a unique view because you're selling to a global pasture. Yeah. Well, that's a good question. We've been trying to do that for 40 years. 
Yeah. And we've been making pretty damn slow progress, especially in your neck of the woods. Yeah. Um, and, and that's because um, of mindsets. Largely it's to do with mindsets. You know, like, um, if you go up to the... U I'm, I'm going to speak candidly, so don't take offence at this. Please. Grazing in the USA is 30 or 40 years behind grazing here. Yep. Now, but in pockets, you're excellent. You know, and what you find, it's really interesting when you travel around and, and look at um, the world. Some of the most entrepreneurial good farmers uh, in grazing are actually in your country, you know, but there's not many of them. And uh, we've, got a, we've started a project here uh, to try and make a change up there, but you know, we, we're limited in our power to do that. Because we, we have the tools that can unlock grass, you know, like, like adopting the pasture-based feeding model that we, that we tout. You can produce two or three times the amount of animals that, that uh, most people think is possible off grass. So there is a real opportunity, but it, you, you work, you're up against um, you're up against a farming mindset. You know, my dad did it that way, but then you get all these. Yeah, I, I, at the end of the day, it, it'll be money that'll drive it. If 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 because we we saw grass fed cattle on the up before the um, GFC, and then and then we saw grass fed the grass fed demand drop right off, and now it's going again. You know, and I think. Um, Value product value will drive the change more than anything, but we're we're trying to educate farmers uh, globally and particularly in the U.S. around um, and North America, the whole of North America. We're trying to educate farmers on what you can do with um, with uh, grazing management, how you can increase productivity, lower costs, and widen the gap between between selling price and cost price. Yeah. We've got a, you know, um, a lot of farmers have got iron disease. You know what that is? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Iron disease is um, the love of, of tractors. You know, we go to a farm in the US and, a, and even a modest sized farm will have a combine harvester. You, if you find a farmer here with a combine harvester, it's one in a thousand, you know? So, so you guys are used to that really um, uh, mechanised based production and, and um, Please tell us what we're doing wrong and how we can, who we can integrate with to, to help um, increase that grass-fed beef um, production. Well, I think that's uh, it's an interesting point uh, that I've been talking about with Josh and some others because I, I think we're at an interesting turning point. Consumers are recognizing the value, uh, the, the nutritional value of pasture-raised meat. I think that, uh, you know, obviously, Confined animal feedlots are getting a bad rap. Uh, there's a movement. Uh, there's also another movement which is recognizing uh, the soil health benefits of uh, yep. proper pasture management. Um, and there's a whole carbon capture story there that is all starting to, to come about. And I think there's a growing awareness of the need, but I don't see any sort of concerted effort to go and make that happen on a global scale. Can, can I just also add um, my, my experience um, in, in, in the US that's a good, good example of going to um, the uh, Sunday market in Mountain View. People are very happy to pay twice the number of dollars for grass-fed beef than they are for the stuff you can buy in the Safeways. Uh, and you actually see the signs and you see the queues of people. It's very much consumer focus. Beef, I'm really proud of that. And yeah. consumers there are yeah. very, very prepared to pay twice <coughs> for mm -hmm. grain fed beef. Um, so there is that consumer issue, which I think is really important. Mm. I guess we're, se we're seeing it in, in organic dairy too, aren't we? You know, there's a big movement towards organic and pasture, right. Right, or partially pasture raised dairy. Um, yeah, but it'd be nice to it'd be nice to be able to tap into. We 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 provide one piece of the puzzle. The piece of the puzzle we provide is the grazing management tools, and and we've got a bit of knowledge about how to graze grass, but that's of course it's got to be customised to the environment. The environment is so different. It doesn't matter where you, you know, and through North America, the the practices in one place are different to the practices in another by a long shot. Yeah. And there's some really good thought leaders um, up there in in that space, and we're trying to link in with those guys and and um, and, and encourage adoption of grazing management. That's the secret to us because the, the total market for our, our type of products up in the US is only about double the market of New Zealand. So that tells you something, doesn't it? Yeah. Your yeah. target market up there, are they, what are they currently doing? Are they arable farms? 
No, they're yeah. beef cattle producers. Yeah, so it's just intensification of their current operations. So I say what? It's intensification of their current operations. Yeah, yeah, just just um, being a bit less reliant on making silage <coughs> and and, um, and just managing their, their pastures better at the moment. Um, you know, and, and you get some guys um, that are um, really advanced in terms of their grazing up there as well. You know, um, these these fellows that call themselves the carbon cowboys and they, they have only six or seven hour shifts. You know, they're doing stuff that we don't do. Yeah. Um, and so there's some real innovation at the top, but the bulk of the market is still um, still nowhere near um, where the average is here. Yeah, it's much much more fun to plant corn and um, drive combines and <laughs> bulldozers to. You know, I went, I saw one farm that, and the guy had uh, about four or five D7s, I think they were, on a stack. Yeah, it's, it's big, eh? Air cop is big, and there's no one better at growing corn in the United States. You guys are amazing up there. You know, with your cost of production through that, that very mechanised um, system is actually pretty good. You know, like, like the, yeah, the, dairy, the dairy costs, our dairy costs aren't that much lower than yours. And yet up there, you've got such a more complicated way of growing, of, of producing meat products, meat and animal products. Anyway, any others? Thank you.